Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our last speaker for this year, uh, Professor Julia Lupton from uh, School of Humanities. Julia grew up on the East Coast in Maryland, and then went uh, to college locally at Johns Hopkins, uh, then went her PhD at Yale before coming here to UC Irvine, where she is uh, the professor of English and comparative literature, and also with a joint appointment in education. So Julia has received a whole host of awards. I won't go into them here, but they include a number of editorial boards, um, a chancellor fellowship here at UCI several years ago, and then uh, most recently a Guggenheim fellowship, which was given for her book project, Shakespeare Dwelling, Fabrication, Hospitality, Design. In addition, she has had an impact on the campus far beyond just her uh, prominent scholarship. She was uh, interim chair at one point, Associate Dean for Research in the School of Humanities, and um, has also um, been doing a number of other things, maybe most recently and prominently um, directing the uh, new Chancellor's uh, program, uh, Illuminations, which is uh, the Chancellor's program of Arts and Culture. In addition, she has a number of other interests, uh, hopefully we'll hear about some of them, but let me just bring up a, a fun one in the spirit of the introduction and also maybe this slide here. Um, she is also uh, the author with her twin, identical twin sister, co-author of um, two books on design. One's called DIY Kids, and the other has this fascinating title, Design Your Life, The Pleasures and Perils of Everyday Things. So I hope we get to hear some about that too. Please welcome Julia. <laughs> context of the series, which I've been observing from afar, but never saw myself as one of the, <laughs> the speakers. <laughs> and so it's quite an honor to be included with such a lineup of, of faculty and staff who have built this university and um, have worked to also build a community that makes the university a warm place as well as a intellectually challenging and rewarding place. Um, so, Initially, I was encouraged not to use slides, so I decided to do props. I'm kind of now, you know, from learning from my drama friends, I'm going to combine props and slides. <laughs> so that's just what I'm going to do. Um, this is a photo that was taken a couple of years ago by one of my daughters, with two of my daughters, the Charlie's Angels pose. So. I'll be maybe coming back to this, but it's, it's fun, and I thought it was a fun way to get things going. I decided to call my remarks Five Things That Matter to Me, and I've organized this as a series of secret envelopes. <laughs> so each envelope contains things associated with a different area of my interests. And I don't quite remember what's in here because it's been a busy morning. <laughs> so it'll be an element of surprise for me as well as for you. So, um, so number one. Well, I believe that number one is family. That's fair, right? <laughs> and I thought I would start with Mother's Day to give you a sense of the character of Mother's Day in my household. Uh, this was the Mother's Day card that my oldest daughter made for me. <laughs> Hence the Charlie's Angels opening. I mean, I feel like you must be doing something right if your firstborn daughter calls you a badass bitch. <laughs> we had a very lively discussion in which my daughter explained to me the difference between a badass bitch and various other <laughs> other types that maybe sometimes I do fall into. So she, so she spared me that on Mother's Day. So she's not here today, although I do have my son here um, in the front row. And um, so this is my, my four children. Um, the oldest one is in the middle. This is from her high school graduation last year. 
And then the triplets are around her. And my son Elliot is here to represent the family. And uh, they're just, you know, certainly four of the things that matter to me <laughs> are these great kids. Um, on the Mother's Day theme, oh, there's my husband. It's actually, I realized it's our anniversary today. Oh. <laughs> we, took this, we took this photo last year for our 25th anniversary. And, and today I, we're having some company and we've got a lot of big lectures here at the School of Humanities, the Wellick, Wellick Lectures. So we said I had to choose between having him come to this or come to the Wellick Lectures. So. His son is representing the household group today. Uh, but Ken teaches at UCLA. We both moved here in 1989. Uh, he proposed to me shortly after I accepted the UCI job offer. It was kind of like a deal. Like I'm, not, I'm not moving west unless I have the rock. <laughs> so we, we worked that out, and we've been here for 26 years now. And our four children were all born here, and although I still consider myself an East Coaster in some ways, having children growing up in California, actually here in Irvine on the Irvine campus, um, really makes me a citizen of the state in a deep way. I now have one child in the UC system at Berkeley, and I told my dean yesterday that my goal is to have four children on four campuses <laughs> in the UC system. Maybe one of them would be UCI, so we're, we're working on that. Um, uh, this is my mother, who really helped form me. She's an academic. Uh, she was a, a pretty serious feminist in the 1970s. And she wrote this book, The Curse, A Cultural History of Menstruation, when my sister and I were about 12 years old. <laughs> this was not easy. My mother wrote the book on badass, <laughs> but she's great. And she's written many books, and she's in retirement now, and she's still writing. She's writing a biography of Maya Angelou, and uh, she's just a terrific, tremendous person who's taught me a lot about writing and also about the beauty of small dogs. <laughs> this is our cat, Stella. And the picture is by my son, Elliot, who's in the front row. And this is a watercolor that he did just last week of our cats. So I'm glad that all of my kids are interested in the arts. And of course, one of the things I'm doing through Illuminations is trying to bring the arts across campus and connect up different, different fields around the arts. And that, of course, starts at home. All right, number two. So now we're going to get a little bit intellectual, but I'm going to still try to keep it uh, real. Not that intellectual and real aren't the same. <laughs> so let's see, that's number two. Well, this probably has to be Shakespeare, because as was mentioned, my scholarship is on Shakespeare, and I teach largely courses on Shakespeare here from freshman through graduate, and also I do a lot of community teaching on Shakespeare. Um, but I decided to represent Shakespeare through some finger puppets that a friend of mine gave to me from her shelf. She was shelf clearing, <laughs> and I was the beneficiary. And I, I chose the finger puppets because um, I want to really honor my colleagues in drama who have been so welcoming to me at the New Swan and improv, I see Joel Rickmuster here, and Letty Garcia, and others from drama. Uh, it's been really just a great privilege in the last five years to really start learning from and collaborating with my students and colleagues in the drama department to become part of really living drama activities. And it's really changed my scholarship, the way I teach, and it's certainly a big part of my interest in being involved in Illuminations is bringing drama as, as a form of, of action research uh, to the humanities and to other parts of the school um, and the campus in its performance basis. So I'm very pleased about that and would be happy to talk more about the new swan and um, the future of Shakespeare here at UCI. We did just start at UCI Shakespeare Center. That's something that Eli Simon and I have wanted to do for many years. It's finally a reality. And we'd like it to be a very inclusive place where Shakespeare is 
available to everyone in his wit and depth and intellectual engagement and physical humor and all of those dimensions. Um, so I hope that you'll be seeing and enjoying a lot of Shakespeare on campus as part of our new initiative. We're really, really excited about that. Um, I feel like I'm going very fast. <laughs> we'll just see what else is next. Okay, so let's see what number three is. Uh, so this is Design Your Life, which is the book that is referred to in the introduction. So I want to talk a little bit about the role of design in my life and uh, how it kind of holds together a lot of different aspects of what I do um, academically, but also just in terms of as a really a tool for living, a tool for community building, institution building, a whole range of things. Is that me? <laughs> Uh, so here's some Shakespeare slides, just quickly before I get into the design part. This is from the library. Um, one of the things that we instituted last summer to support the new SWAN is what we call First Folio Fridays. And this was really an exciting collaboration for me with the library. UCI owns a folio, which is the sort of collected works of Shakespeare. There's about 250 of them in the country. And UCI actually happens to own one. But it doesn't get out of its little house very often. So we thought it would be really fun to have activities at the library that would bring the folio out to make it something that people could look at and uh, learn about and have a kind of direct connection with. Uh, so we, we're going to have two more of these this summer. There'll be two Fridays in August. And I really encourage you guys to come. I give a short talk about whichever play is uh, being performed at the New Swan. And then we go into the special collections room and we get to look at the first folio itself, uh, but also at various kinds of memorabilia involving Shakespeare and drama that special collections has been holding. And of course, this in our 50th anniversary is a really exciting time to see these materials that have been uh, saved and are ready for enjoyment, for scholarship, for research, and just for appreciation. So this is my son and a couple of his friends at the New Swan. And so the New Swan is very much a family affair for us. We, uh, I go usually once a weekend, if not more, but I try to drag various teenagers and my spouse, <laughs> friends to come with me as well. And so here we are enjoying um, an evening. Uh, I believe that was Romeo and Juliet from last year. Okay, so number three, now we're into the design, um, the design element. And so design really for me is something that I've learned to appreciate and also to practice through my sister, Ellen Lumpton. As you can see, we're identical twins. Um, so my triplets are fraternal, but my sister and I are identical. And uh, she is a graphic designer. And we grew up in Baltimore. And initially, we both had, we we're very, very similar in terms of our interests and our talents. We both were, were pretty verbal and pretty visual. And then in high school, we kind of divided the pie. You know, it was becoming, we wanted to differentiate our, our identities and our goals. And so Ellen had, you know, been developing pretty seriously as a painter and draftswoman. And I was getting interested in foreign languages and my mother's side of the house, which was uh, literary studies, literary scholarship. And so I became increasingly academic and pretty committed to going to you know, the best university I could go to and become a, a, a PhD like my mom. And she really wanted to develop the arts. And so we divided. Uh, but you know, we had divided once before, and that was in my mother's uterus. <laughs> right, and that was one cell that divided into two. So genetically, we are very, uh, very close in terms of our aptitudes. 
And when she got to art school, she discovered that she really liked research, and she really liked writing, and she really liked teaching. And I found that I really needed to keep visual arts as part of my, my identity and my activity to really feel like a full person. And so she ended up going on into a career as a graphic designer, but also a design writer and design educator. She's written about 20 books on graphic design, and she's a curator at the Cooper Hewitt in New York. And I continued to, as desktop publishing took off, um, she taught me about fonts and various kinds of layout and proportions and design tricks. And I, I use those skills every day here at the university in developing visual identities on the fly and basically for free for whatever group that I'm part of. I love making flyers and you know, logos and color schemes, whatever I can, but to help give projects um, some sense of momentum. So graphic design is, I find, is just an incredible tool for institution building and community building, and, and it's also just a lot of fun. Other women knit, I make flyers, and <laughs> things like that. So uh, we wrote a book called DIY Kids, and Elliot will remember this. Uh, the, all the artwork was designed by our, my four and her two children and their friends. And we wrote the book over a period of about two years. And the kids were just, you know, thrown when I would bring out the art supplies <laughs> after a certain point because it's like, oh, mom has another project. <laughs> but the book has a lot of design activities. It's sort of a craft book, but we distinguish it. We distinguish it from craft. Is it where this is? Or? You have to turn the, your it might be your email. Email. It's this, do you think? Yeah, I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> Sound is not my specialty. <laughs> sorry about that. Very sorry about that. Um, so the projects are really um, trying to introduce young people to design processes. So there's stuff in here about designing your own logos, branding your own party, designing t-shirts, there's a fashion design section, an interior design section. We also have interviews with designers so that young people can learn about design as a career option. So we had a lot of fun writing this book and it turned up in like museum bookstores all over the world. They get little photographs from, from friends <laughs> saying, you know, we saw your book at the Guggenheim or we saw your book at the Hirshhorn. So it's been a lot of fun. And then we also wrote a book together uh, that's more about our generation uh, called Design Your Life. And a lot of the people sometimes ask me, you know, how do you accomplish the various things that you accomplish? You've got these four kids and you know your job and you do a lot of administration and you're also a good teacher and you manage to be a little bit, little bit involved in the community. And my answer is really is design is what is helpful because design is really about um, time management and understanding the relative values of different parts of your life and creating links between them so that everything that you do kind of resonates with the other parts. Um, so, you know, I see the work that I'm doing with illuminations as a form of research. Is also a form of service. But I'm getting to learn about different arts. I'm getting to learn about how the arts can be applied in science and social science settings. Uh, so for me, there's an integration there. And design really, to me, means integration. Is how do you bring different parts of your passions, of what matters to you, and bring those things together into a, um, into a, if not a complete whole, at least a kind of integrated flow of activities. Um, so we have a section on procrastination. <laughs> and since we're, yeah, we're both overachievers, uh, our, our theory of procrastination is that procrastination is great. You just have to start really early. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're sort of, you know, it's a process that eventually leads you to the, the promised end. Um, we have a manifesto about design in the book. 
uh, defining design in a whole bunch of different ways that are meant to be accessible not just to professional designers, but to people who may not think of themselves as designers, but in fact are designing all the time um, with all of the um, managerial and administrative activities that we bring to our households and our workplaces and our personal lives. Um, and we're hoping to also write another book together that would be called Storytelling for Designers. And this is something that would grow out of teaching that we've both been doing over the past uh, few years and that would bring together some of the work that I do about design for humanists and some of the work that she does that's about the humanities for designers and put that together in one book that might be of interest to both communities. So we're going to try to, we we're procrastinating, <laughs> but we're starting early on that procrastination. <coughs> uh, and then I just want to say something about my father. I said that my mother is the sort of inspiration for my scholarship, but my father is really the inspiration for both of us for the, our interests in design and architecture. He's not trained as an architect. His training is all in English literature, like my mother, but he left that early on and really went into home renovation and uh, construction. And he's kind of a DIY architect. You know, if he had been born at a different time and things had been a little different, he probably would have become an architect. And we learned a lot from him uh, in terms of, of all of these, these values and concerns. So number four. Okay, so let's see. What, anyone know what this is? I want to talk about a little bit. I know we're, we're invited to talk about religion. <laughs> and certainly one of the things that matters to me is, is, is Judaism. I was not born Jewish. I got involved in Judaism a couple of years after my husband and I got married. It was very much a joint adventure. Uh, he was raised as a secular Jew um, in the Chicago area. And I was raised by fairly radical ex even anti-Catholics and <laughs> so we we cut we had a very secular wedding uh, in 1989 and then when we decided to start producing these young people um, we felt that we needed to do some research into faith traditions and I was very interested in learning more about Judaism and so I converted to Judaism and the kids have been raised Jewish, and I think they appreciate it. <laughs> and um, let's see, I think I have a picture. Uh, this is on the, this is the triplets. <laughs> this is on the day of, of Elliot's circumcision and the girls' baby naming. So it's a very beautiful day. A few people, Vivian was here that day. And some, perhaps some other people in the room. This was 15 years ago. And uh, the Havdalah candle is used at the end of the Jewish Shabbat. So you mark the end of the Sabbath by lighting a candle that returns you to uh, profane time. So you're marking the end of sacred time and re-entering the work week. Well, I love the work week. <laughs> <laughs> I find absolute rest to be a terrible burden. <laughs> is a great gift that I observe in a fairly minimal way, but I try to observe it somewhat. And so I love the Havdalah candle. Um, the braiding of the two strands of wax have been, of course, interpreted in many ways because the Jews are great interpreters, and that's part of my attraction to Judaism. Uh, but one way to see it is, is, in the, is the, the braiding together of sacred and profane time which is marked in the Havdalah ceremony. So I thought I would share that with you. Um, I can certainly say a lot more about the role that, you know, the Jewish community and Jewish observance have played in my life. I would certainly say that as I get older, my relationship to it deepens. I respect more and more different areas of the wisdom 
of, of the rituals as well as the texts on which Judaism is based. And uh, when my daughter went to Berkeley, uh, they, the kids all went to Jewish school over at Tarbut the Torah. And there was a lot of, a lot of cynicism and um, dissing of various aspects of the curriculum and of the requirements there. And uh, when my daughter got to Berkeley um, as a freshman, uh, I got a text from her on Friday, which is when the Jewish Sabbath begins. And she said that she was at Hillel um, at the Shabbat dinner. And so I felt like that was really pretty cool because uh, it wasn't something that we forced on the kids beyond encouraging them to go to Jewish school, uh, but it was something that uh, we wanted them to be able to choose, and they had to know what it was that they were choosing. And so I was very happy to get that text and to get at least a couple times a month a similar text. So that was good. Um, I think I just have one more thing. So the, the last thing, of course, has to be UCI itself, which is what's brought all of us together in this room. And I was trying to imagine how to represent UCI in one of my envelopes. Of course, I didn't want to have an anteater because that would be too obvious. <laughs> would I do a library card, my W-2 form, <laughs> my office plate? Um, So I really pondered it. I didn't want to be silly. I didn't want to be foolish. But I came back. <laughs> I came back to Peter. I was, you know, why not? So when my daughter started Berkeley and I took her up there for orientation, I bought a license plate. I never thought I would do this. <laughs> but it says Berkeley Mom. And it's on the back of my car. And then I put it on, and then I went to the UCI bookstore, and I got a UCI license plate. <laughs> and I put it on the front of my car. <laughs> um, so driving forward <laughs> with UCI. Um, because UCI has really formed me. Uh, I've been here for 26 years. I came here as a very young, untenured person, not a Californian, not a driver. <laughs> Um, really, my family all on the East Coast, it was pretty difficult for me. And uh, it took me you know, quite a few years to feel really comfortable in California, and perhaps quite a few years to feel really kind of bonded and committed uh, to, to being an anteater. <laughs> zot, zot. <laughs> um, but really, that has been what I've become. Um, I had opportunities to leave. Those opportunities were soul-searching moments in terms of where I wanted to live, where I wanted my family to be, where my husband wanted to be. There were also opportunities to recommit to, uh, to UC Irvine as an institution. Um, I'm proud to have helped build uh, various programs on campus. We're bringing back communities out there. Our educational partnership program in the fall has been on a, a brief hiatus, and it is returning. Um, we are starting the UCI Shakespeare Center. I am extremely happy to be involved with Illuminations and to be able to help create the ethos and the look and the original programming uh, for Illuminations. And so I just feel very grateful to Irvine for having allowed me to develop a range of, of skills and interests. No one said no to me when it comes to developing my interests. I've never been told, no, you can't write about design because you're a Shakespeare scholar. Um, I've never been told, no, you can't, you can't go and hang out the new swan because you should be teaching our students. Uh, I, the drama faculty have let me attend their rehearsals, been very, very gracious with me, and that's really changed my research and my orientation towards drama as someone who was trained in English literature, which is very text-based. So, um, in terms of a whole range of, of civic and artistic and scholarly activities, I really felt like I've been able to grow here, and I'm just thoughts on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's one image I could end with, the Charlie's Angels image, which is, you know, <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, but we could also add that this image, which we took last week, which is, <laughs> you might have seen the giant ball rolling around campus. Um, this was brought here by the Persian Studies Program, and Illuminations helped co-sponsor it. It's a ball that's rolling around the world, thanks to a very innovative young Iranian woman artist who's interested in public art and its transformative potential. And it was just a great experience having her on campus, and I really loved having my moment with the ball. <laughs> so I thought I'd end on that note. So thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have some quite a number of minutes now to uh, ask questions of Professor Elton. So there will be at least two, maybe three mics around. Please wait for the mic to come to you so that we can get it on the video face. I'll warm up the audience for you, Julia. Thank you for coming and sharing. Excellent. I have a question. The numbers that you use yeah. displayed, what was the font and also how did you, uh, envelopes. How did you do that? Very creative. Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> she didn't think really. <laughs> well, these were stenciled by Hannah, who's my oldest daughter, and she's home now for a month from Berkeley. And um, so I, I said, would you please, Deck, I'm giving this talk, and I want to share something handmade is in the spirit of the DIY kids book that we wrote together when you were little. <laughs> and we've set up the garage as her studio. She's majoring in art and art history. Couldn't be happier. And so she's basically, when she's not with her friends, she's in the garage doing these different projects this summer, including the Mother's Day card. And so she stenciled these with spray paint. And I was very happy with how they came out due to be visible from the back. Yeah. So you talked about your book, Design Your Life, yes. and I am in computer science, and it kind of reminded me of a theme that some techie people follow that I guess you could call life hacking, yes. of making your life as efficient as possible, so you can spend more time on the things you care about. And is that sort of what your book is about? life hacking for my generation. So it's, it's kind of geared at working women uh, with kids and who are doing a lot of different stuff. It's not only for women, and it's not only for my generation, but the other books that she and I worked together on were definitely for younger people. So the first book that she involved me in is called uh, DIY Design It Yourself. And this book um, was she wrote with her MFA students in graphic design. And they were all in their 20s, and so it's like how, how to brand your band and you know make CD labels. It was published back in the day when people still had CDs. Um, press kits, um, very uh, t-shirt designs, various kinds of things for for 20-somethings. And of course, DIY kits was very much geared towards uh, 12 and under, really at the age of our kids at the time that we were writing the book. And so Design Your Life was really meant to be life hacking, absolutely, um, but life hacking for us, the kinds of life hacking that we do. And I continue to be an avid reader of life hacking columns, even though I'm not writing on that topic anymore. Um, but I have various secrets. <laughs> Can you share one of them? Sure. The one, the one that I learned most recently, this is from Amanda Swain, who I work with over the Humanities Commons. Um, and so she, her life hacking tip is, um, I've been practicing it for about two weeks, and it's, I think it's good. Which is when someone asks how you're doing, don't say, oh, I'm so busy. But actually, that busy, being busy and being productive are opposites. And that, so what you want to say instead is, and this is what I've been practicing, I'm great, I have a lot of projects going on. I'm really interested in the different things that I'm doing. It's really neat to be engaged with a lot of different people on campus. It's the same thing as being busy, but it recodes it in terms of moving forward rather than running in place. 
Like as busy as what as busy as a busy signal on the old telephones that you guys <laughs> don't remember. Okay, but, but being productive is, is 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 being in motion with other people towards shared goals. And so I really like that. And there's actually a great essay called What is a Short Story by John Barth, the great fiction writer. And he actually uses a very similar idea in his discussion that's really geared towards people who are in creative writing about how to write a good story. We want to develop this in our, in our storytelling book for graphic designers. And he says that um, there's a difference between effort and work. And bad short stories show a lot of effort. There's a lot of busyness in the middle, a lot of complication, a lot of activity, a lot of extra characters. But a story that really works, uh, the pieces fall together and they make sense and they have a sense of coherence and satisfaction. So that's part of what it means for me to try to design parts of my life, is to try to transform effort into work or busyness into productivity. And then to try to, to present that, communicate that with people. Um, and, and, and then also when you say that you're, you're, you're enjoying all your projects, if you say you're busy to someone, then they feel like that you don't have time for them. Right? It's very disengaged, it's very disorienting. Whereas if you say you've got a lot of projects, you're involving them in those. Right, because we're all here together in a joint educational and civic enterprise. Right, so we're all doing that, and we want to be able to express that in ways that make us feel rewarded and engaged. Thank you. Hi, Ellen. Oh, good. Because my voice does not hurt. I, I do. Really? That was great. Thank you. Um, the other. Just as I was listening to you, the other um, kind of, um, I don't know, the notion that I get about designing your life is, I guess I do get that distinction between being busy and being productive or effort versus work. But you also said something about UCI never saying no to you when you want to do things that may not kind of look like right. they're in your field or whatever. Or I think that what I'm hearing from you is that you're also designing your life in a way that you're not just being um, told by the university that you have to do all of these things for your CV, but you're doing it. That success is a much more comprehensive concept than sort of what we think we need to do. You know? Yes, yes. Sense. That's Ellen Olshansky from nursing. I just, I've learned so much from Ellen. Because and I, I see nursing as really just a, a model profession and discipline because it is integrative. It, it puts the pieces together, it puts community together, it puts science together, it puts communication together, and sees those things as all needing each other. And I think that's what we need. I think that's where, where UCI really excels, is in its opportunity um, for those kinds of conversations. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I mean, obviously, I do a lot of a lot of administrative work that I don't necessarily adore. So I want to say that I'm never busy <laughs> in that sense that I just described. But I aim to transform busyness into something like productivity. That productivity still sounds too industrial. Um, so maybe design, something that has a kind of the coherence of design, would be a better way to to describe that. But I, I want to be doing work that is satisfying to me personally and that is satisfying to me personally because it's having positive impacts for others that I'm working with or that I'm teaching or that I'm otherwise engaged with. And I do think UCI has enabled me to do that. Okay, time for another question. Hi, how many hours of sleep do you get in I would I aim for seven. They can be a little iffy. It's not my strong point. <laughs> but you know, I do sleep. I, I try to get to bed early, I try to get up early because I love the early morning. That would be one of my other more sort of pragmatic life hacking. It's just that the morning is a time for me and I really enjoy, you know. Firing up my Adobe Creative Suite in the morning, 
it's all project oriented. It's not that I'm making things that are just for me. And what I love about design is that it's art for people. It's art for use. It's art for activity. But I enjoy, you know, working with my files, you know, in these off moments and kind of getting into the day that way. Do you find that the sleep process at all, is there anything that comes to you in that, that different consciousness? I think so. I think that's why I like the early morning. I think things resolve overnight. I can go to bed kind of um, concerned about various issues. And then they make more sense the next day. So I think it is resolving. Can you tell us more about the Shakespeare Center? Sure. Oh, hi. hi. <laughs> One of my first folio fans. <laughs> um, yeah, well, the Shakespeare Center is, uh, Eli Son and I are the co-directors of it, but it involves a lot of faculty uh, from different units, including uh, arts, all departments in the arts, as well as many departments in the humanities, plus education and the library. So we're really a four unit center. And we're trying to, we've already been doing a lot of these activities. Uh, so part of the idea of having a center is to gather those activities together and give them a sense of there. And that's part of what design does and part of what naming does. And it's one of the things that the university is very good at. It's very willing to let you name something. <laughs> and then have it you know, continue and, and get bigger and stronger because it has some kind of identity. Um, so we're continuing to do academic support for the New Swan Shakespeare Festival, um, First Folio Fridays, uh, but there's also new activities going on. For example, you may have seen Jane Page's Shaken Shakespeare, uh, the young people with the yellow t-shirts, and they'll come up to you and they will start reciting a bit of Shakespeare without you asking. <laughs> maybe you're jogging, maybe you're texting, you're not necessarily in the mood for Shakespeare, uh, but they're there to kind of punch up your day. It's very quick, it's a very quick intervention, and then they hand you a postcard that says, congratulations, you've been Shakespeare. Uh, and Jane also did Shakespeare shorts for free over in this beautiful site-specific spot next to Lot 7. Uh, we're also instituting a Shakespeare weekend this summer, which will be a whole weekend of study around the two plays that are being performed in the New Swan. And we're also instituting a public Shakespeare lecture that will be on February 25th. The topic is Shakespeare and Lincoln. I'm really excited about it. It will include an academic lecture, but also um, speeches. Uh, recited by Richard Brustoff in the drama department from both Lincoln and Shakespeare. So the idea of the public lectures is, is to have very outward looking, um, humanistic, but also experimental uh, lectures that will be of interest to undergraduates and staff, as well as to theater makers and scholars, bring people in from the community and celebrate various aspects of Shakespeare's art and his legacy. Um, so that's one of the things that we're adding. And then, yeah, it's really a question of how successful we are in raising money. We'd like to you know, have an endowed chair. We'd like to have a graduate fellowship. We'd like to have essay prizes. But right now, we're just basically you know, providing, uh, boosting up and amplifying things that we've been doing and really enjoy doing and then adding some new things. Thank you. Thank you, Cherie. One more question? OK, good. Share some of your strategies and uh, for raising a family. You came to UCI 26 years ago as a young professional. There are a lot of young professionals in here, yeah. and had four young children to raise and yet do well here in your career. How did you manage all of that? I'm looking at my son here. <laughs> well, um, one of the chapters in our book has the title, How to Spend Less Time with Your Kids. <laughs> uh, which they weren't real happy about <laughs> as a title, my kids, I mean. But the part of our part of our theme there, and I think it's actually we were ahead of the curve, because now it's called free range child <laughs> child rearing, which is how I was raised by my hippie parents. 
Um, but you know, it's kind of just um, de de scheduling a little bit and not having too many extracurricular activities for young children, um, having activities for them to do at home that are meaningful, having them be comfortable here at UCI when they either want to come or, or, or have to come for some reason. So I think that's been part of it. I also really do feel that having a lot of children is easier than having a few. <laughs> I can't really say, speak from experience, but I remember like, when I went, used to visit my sister, when we would be with her kids, there would always have to be like a big activity. You have to go to the science center, or the children's museum, or the museum of um, deviant art, which is a very <laughs> cool place down at, she lives in Baltimore, all these things are down in the inner, in the inner harbor. And it would take, you know, it would be a whole day. You have to get, she doesn't drive, so you have to get down there and then back on the bus and the cab and the water taxi. It would be a whole day. It's like, now she would come to Irvine. <laughs> this is when the kids were under 10. And like, the big activity would be going to Albertsons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like, it's 11 a.m. The twins have been working all day on their book. Now we're going to go to Albertsons. <laughs> And the kids would get all excited and put on their shoes. <laughs> and they would go to Del Taco. <laughs> and we'd go to the grocery store and they'd pick out some like bubbles. <laughs> and my sister's kids would be like, Mom, <laughs> we're at a grocery store. <laughs> so I'm not sure that I would necessarily want you to try that at home. But it worked for me. And I, 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 they're very creative kids, you know. Um, they they learned the the festival that Albertsons gave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, I have a question for Julia. Hi. Buddy, buddy. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, just thank you for this wonderful lecture, and this is a question on behalf of Chris and I, your students. Um, <laughs> what advice would you have for um, future academics, sort of, that look up to you, and what would you what would be your biggest like piece of advice for us? Well, I really think that being a, a, a good designer, a good DIY designer, not a professional designer, but really knowing your way around Adobe Creative Suite, and Chris has learned some, some of these skills from me, um, it's, it's, a, it's a life skill. Whatever, you know, for your teaching, for your administrative work, for your community work, um, these th having your, having access to and control over your files, uh, and being able to create a fresh, beautiful look that really expresses your project the way that only you can express it, is something which I have found incredibly sustaining and rewarding. And so, in the Humanities Commons, we're trying to encourage skill sharing for, among graduate students to share their technical skills. Uh, your generation will you know, to shape academia in increasingly visual directions. I want art and design to be part of that shaping. I don't want all to be about maximizing the number of student credit hours through, um, through computers, uh, but also to be um, that we live in a beautiful, aesthetically beautiful world, and that the, um, the typographic environment is one that reflects the humanities and arts. And these, these things shouldn't be outsourced. Uh, these things should be um, created with care and thought and be supplements to what we do. So uh, that's, that's very important to me. Can I um, abuse yes. Yes. the power I have yes. holding the microphone in my hand to yes. ask one last question? Yes. Um, I thought the part you talked about uh, your move for Judaism was fascinating yes. and wonderful. I wonder, if, could you talk about, um, you know, the reaction of your family and your badass parents to this, <laughs> and also whether you see any influences in your life that, after that point that maybe made that more uh, likely that you would consider such a thing? Well, my parents were um, not really happy about it initially, not because they had anything against Judaism, but because they really did not like religion. And religion had been a very negative force in their lives. Um, they felt that it had restricted their imaginations and experiential possibilities. 
and they were very happy to raise um, you know, sort of radically secular kids. And my sister has remained radically secular. And I kind of consider myself post-secular, meaning that I acknowledge the importance of secularization. I'm not a fundamentalist in any way. My relationship to God is you know, six degrees of separation. <laughs> um, so I have a complicated theology, a complicated relationship to the texts and the traditions. Um, What's really interesting is my mother in retirement, she taught at a historically black university, Morgan State University in Baltimore. And she spent most of her professional life working with African American students and colleagues and writing on African American literature. And she retired to Cape May, New Jersey, which is unlike Baltimore, a very segregated town. And she found that it was very hard to mix socially with African Americans, except at church. And so she joined the Moravian Baptist Church, and she loves it. And she goes to Bible study, and she goes to church pretty much every Sunday. And she reads poetry at services, and she's become she has some kind of lay leadership role now. She says, the only problem for her is Jesus. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm cool with that. <laughs> Um, but it's actually brought us very close together, because we actually now talk about religion. And before I felt like, you know, I didn't want to tell her, oh, we're doing Shabbat now, or oh, you know, I, I'm fasting, or, you know, it's my Seder, because I felt like it was, it was a wedge between us, and I value intimacy. Well, now it's actually something that we really share, and, and we're both interested in religion for similar reasons, because of text and community. And both of us have, from different paths, found text and community through re-engaging as adults by choice with, um, with faith communities and faith practices. Um, so I'm very proud of her. And it's been really interesting to have this kind of parallel journey at this stage in our lives. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so we do kind of in a few minutes before the hour, so people can back, get back to their work. Um, let me remind you of two things. One is that you do have this questionnaire on your seat. Please uh, fill it out. And second of all, we have a fantastic picture, almost all lined up for you, so look for that. We'll start again with a new season of what matters in July in October. So thank you, let's all thank Professor Martin.